so good up everybody on behalf of uh, isi bangalore students i welcome all of you to this lecture our today's speaker is professor mahesh who is a professor of mathematics at iisc bangalore he obtained his phd from university of cambridge with number theory being his field of interest his works are mainly on ivasava theory which is a study of objects of arithmetic interest over infinite tower of number fields with great pleasure and honor i welcome the professor to enlighten us on some conjectures in transcendental number theory over to you now sir okay so i'm i was under the impression that we start at 4 um but i need to uh, i need to log in also through my ipad so that i can uh, okay sir okay no problem i can share my screen let's see okay so i just okay, so i need my phone should work Do do I do I need to wait until four or have people already? Uh, are there? I mean, everyone who's supposed to come is already here. Yes, sir. Almost there. All almost everyone are present. Okay, almost everyone is here. Uh, let's see then. Share, share screen. Start podcast. Let's see. Someone's raised their hand. I don't know what they want to say. <clears throat> Sir, uh, would you like to take up questions in between the lecture and make it an interactive session, or do you prefer taking questions at the end? uh i prefer to take questions during the lecture so if you have any questions please i, I don't know whether you can unmute yourself or not so you can either put them in the in the chat box which i'll try to keep an eye on or uh, no problem sir we will let you know the questions once they are put up on the chat box okay yeah no i have i have opened it here so okay so <clears throat> so let me start uh, my talk since uh, it seems everyone is here uh, will you guys admit people or yeah okay because i keep seeing this message to admit people all right so um, as a as, well thank you for the introduction and uh, thank you for inviting me to give a talk here i have not given uh, such a talk before uh, meaning us my usual talks uh, my usual audience uh, is uh, uh, research mathematicians so um, so i hope this talk is not too technical uh, and uh, each of you gets something out of it um, the second half of the talk is a bit technical actually um, Uh, so so do ask questions even if you get some idea of what the what i'm talking about i think that uh, uh, i'll be happy with that um so as you heard i work in uh, number theory specifically vasava theory so transcendental number theory is not really my area of uh, main area of research uh, but i but i like this topic very much and so i thought i'll i'll speak about this uh and uh, whatever you kind of you know you you learn things in high school which are kind of on the border of this uh learning transcendental numbers but you don't quite uh, learn about them uh, in fact when i was in high school the first proof i remember was irrationality of uh, square root of 2 and uh, that really uh, caught my attention so um, now i think i think that's the thing that really got me interested in in mathematics in the sense of uh, um kind of you know you can prove such things and um 
uh, and so on. So, uh, so that's why I chose this topic, transcendental number theory. Okay. So here, so there is a bunch of. I mean, okay. So I'll I'll start with uh, with with familiar stuff. So I I suppose everyone knows what a rational number is. So rational number is is a number which can be represented as a. Um, uh, ratio of two integers a over b with b not equal to zero. Okay, so uh, of course the representation need not be unique. Uh, uh, a over b is same as two times a over two times b, which is same as five times a over five times b, which is same as minus ten over a times minus ten over b, and so on. But uh, alpha is a is a, if alpha can be written as a ratio of two rash uh, two integers, then then alpha is a rational number um, equivalently and we we learned this in high school um, uh, alpha uh, a real number is a rational number if if the decimal expansion of alpha eventually repeats okay so if it stops then it repeats as zero 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 if it doesn't stop then there's a finite sequence that keeps repeating you know seven eight three nine seven eight three nine or, or something like that um, and and these two statements are equivalent, and uh, I'm sure you have seen the proof. If not, you can try to you can try to prove this, uh, uh, right? So uh, that uh, a decimal expansion eventually repeats if and only if alpha is a ratio of two integers. Okay, so here's a bunch of notation which you may or may not have seen. So this is Q. Okay, uh, bold faced Q as it's called. The line is only to kind of indicate that this this Q is is uh, different than uh, if I write Q in English. So bold faced Q Q denotes the set of rational numbers. Okay, Z denotes the set of integers. Um, R denotes the set of real numbers, and C denotes the set of complex numbers. Okay, so these uh, I'll use these notations again and again. I is a fixed square root of minus one, and so complex numbers are all elements of the form a plus uh, i b, where a and b are real numbers. Okay, so um, so if you for for the purpose of this talk, if you don't if you're not familiar with complex numbers, you can simply ignore complex numbers. Okay, and and uh, whatever I say will make perfect sense if we are just in the realm of real numbers, and it's equally uh, conceptually deep uh, whether uh, one works with complex numbers or real numbers. Okay, so you are not going to lose out on any ideas by just restricting yourself to the universe of complex numbers, uh, real numbers. Okay, so uh, a complex number is called algebraic. So this this notion you may or may not have seen before. Uh, what is an algebraic number? Uh, so if you like, we start with natural numbers, and then uh, by um, you by adding two natural numbers, you get natural number. But if you subtract two natural numbers, you may not get a natural number. And so we need integers. We need negative. Uh, uh, negative uh, uh, of natural numbers as well. And when you uh, do, uh, when you multiply two integers, you get uh, you again get an integer. But if you divide one integer by another, you may not get an integer. And so you kind of expand your domain and go into uh, re uh, rational numbers. And then if you take limits of rational numbers, you know this uh, like finite uh, this uh, truncated decimal expansion, and you you kind of increase the decimal expansion to arbitrary lengths. So these limits will give you real numbers in uh, in general. Right? Now, uh, what algebraic numbers are, or if you if you want to solve polynomial equations, if you want to find zeros of polynomial equations, you need what are called algebraic numbers. Okay, but we but I am a number theorist, so I, I am interested in integers and rational numbers. So my algebra. So when I say algebraic number. I, I am only solving polynomials with coefficients in rational numbers. Okay, so that's why I define these algebraic numbers. So a number alpha is called an algebraic Efficiency number. Coefficients in natural, in rational numbers or in integers. I sorry, I couldn't hear you. Yeah, the yeah. coefficients. The coefficients are in rational numbers or in integers. 
I will uh, I'll make a comment about that. It doesn't matter whether I take them as integers or or rash or, or uh, rational numbers, because if uh, if I take them as rational numbers, I can always multiply by my polynomial by a uh, by common denominators of all these AIs. Okay, and then uh, then then I can assume that all my coefficients are integers. Uh, yeah, so I have to, uh, but I have to allow integers. I can't simply take natural numbers. Okay, I have to allow uh, negative uh, integers as well. Okay, so alpha is called an algebraic uh, number if there exists a non-zero polynomial who, uh, with alpha as its root. Okay, so there may be other roots, but alpha has to be a root of, of that. So that is what uh, what an algebraic number is. So if you can solve, uh, so whatever whatever numbers you get by solving polynomials with rational coefficients, all those numbers are called uh, algebraic numbers. Okay. And uh, while we are defining algebraic numbers, let me also say what degree of uh, algebraic number is. So I can define notion of degree of algebraic number. So if alpha is my algebraic number, then the smallest positive integer n, such that alpha is a root of a polynomial of degree n, is uh, is called degree of of alpha. Okay, and uh, because n is 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 a positive integer, there will be such a smallest n, right? There, there is a poly, there is a non-zero polynomial uh, whose root is alpha, and you just take the set of all such polynomials, you collect their degrees. These are positive integers, and positive integers are what are called well-ordered. So, if you have a non-empty subset of positive integer, there is always a smallest element in that uh, subset. So, we call that the degree of uh, of alpha. Okay, and I will denote it as uh, degree alpha like this okay so i'll denote it it like this okay that's the notation so here are some examples if alpha is a rational number to begin with then degree of alpha is simply one because it's a root of this polynomial x minus the rational number itself okay so so this polynomial has two coefficients one here and then a by b these are the two coefficients uh, and degree has to be at least one. So, uh, so, so if you can find a polynomial of uh, of uh, some degree, then um, of degree one, then the degree has to be degree of alpha has to be one. Okay, here's a non-trivial example: square root of two. And uh, <clears throat> here's a non-trivial example, which is square root of two. And the, uh, the polynomial whose uh, uh, the polynomial with rational coefficients whose root is square root of two is x square minus two. Okay, so so there is at least a degree two polynomial whose root uh, uh, is square root of two. So degree of square root of two is is uh, less than or equal to two, and we can show that square root of two is not rational. Which means that square root of two, uh, which means that there is no degree one polynomial whose root is square root of two, and so uh, the degree of two is is actually uh, degree of square root of two is actually two. Okay. Now here is a non-trivial example, and you can take this as an exercise to to show that degree of this alpha is four. So it's a non-trivial exercise, uh, but uh, may be fun for you to try. So if alpha, if you take alpha to be square root of two plus square root of um, three, then here is a uh, degree four polynomial whose root is alpha. So this is an easy exercise to to show that uh, uh, alpha is a, is a root of uh, of this polynomial. Uh, the harder part is that degree of alpha is four, but it's it's not. Uh, uh, I mean, it, you know, it's. Uh, it, it's harder, but it's not uh, impossible to do, of course. Okay, uh, and 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 a bit of notation. So all algebraic numbers, the set of all algebraic numbers inside complex numbers, I'll denote that by um, Q bar. Okay, so these are algebraic numbers. These are numbers that you can uh, get by doing some algebra. 
So that's why they are called algebraic numbers. If you solve polynomial equations, you get these numbers. All right. So now moving on to the uh, to the topic of uh, the main topic of this uh, talk, we move to transcendental numbers. So what are transcendental numbers? Well, any number which is not algebraic is a transcendental number. Okay, so this transcends beyond our our algebra. So that's why we kind of name it as transcendental number. So any any alpha which is not algebraic is called transcendental. What does it mean? So you can also say that uh, alpha is transcendental if there does not exist a non-zero polynomial with coefficients in Q such that alpha is a root of that polynomial. Okay, so any polynomial you take, any non-zero polynomial you take uh, with coefficients in Q, um, uh, any polynomial f, f of alpha will never be uh, zero. Okay. So, uh, so that's uh, that's called transcendental. So we have defined it. I gave you examples of algebraic numbers. So there are certainly numbers which are algebraic, okay. But I, uh, this is you know maybe all complex numbers are are algebraic. Uh, you know the at this point, if you have just uh, if you if your knowledge of algebraic and transcendental number is limited to what I have said in these. Uh, 10 minutes, then maybe there is no transcendental number. Maybe every uh, complex number is algebraic. So uh, because it's not it's not clear whether you know how to find a number which is uh, not algebraic. You you if I give you a number, you can't literally go and try uh, evaluating that uh, evaluating every polynomial at that number. OK, so uh, so, so that's that's what the remark is. So, usually, if if I give you a number, uh, arbitrary real number, then uh, it's very hard to to determine whether it's a transcendental number or not. Okay, so you know people kind of suspected numbers were transcendental for centuries, but they couldn't uh, actually show any uh, whether any particular number was transcendental or not. Um, then there are two ways of showing that uh, there are in fact transcendental numbers. Uh, two very different ways of sh showing ex existence of transcendental number. Uh, one is due to Cantor. Okay, so this is due to um, this is due to uh, Cantor. He was the first one to really systematically study infinities, and he sh what he showed was that. Um, the number of complex numbers or real numbers is uncountable. Okay, so he defined different ways of uh, different infinities, uh, and and you may have uh, encountered this. Um, uh, so uh, so the the number of integers are countable. Okay, and anything that you can. Uh, uh, map one to one and onto with integers is countable. So, uh, so if you have seen the notion of countable, then you know that Q is countable. Okay, so that's beyond sort of uh, integers. Uh, Q is also countable, but you can also show that Q bar is countable because you can show that the number of polynomials uh, with coefficients in Q that that set is count the the set of all polynomials with coefficients in Q that set is countable. And uh, each polynomial has only finitely many roots. So, so, so the set of algebraic numbers is countable. Whereas Cantor proved by uh, his famous diagonal, uh, uh, diagonal argument that the set of real numbers is actually uncountable. Okay, so there are many more real numbers in very precise sense than there are rational numbers. So this means that if you take the set of all complex numbers which are not algebraic, you know, so the set of all transcendental uh, complex numbers, which is this set C minus Q bar, this set is uncountable. So not only is this set uh, non-empty, it is actually uncountable. So there are many, many transcendental numbers. In fact, almost any number 
uh, any complex number is transcendental. So if you if you have a complex plane and you drop a pin on it, it it hits randomly something, and that something will almost surely be transcendental number, you know, with probability uh, one. So. Uh, uh, so 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 basically you know the, there are far more transcendental numbers than there are algebraic numbers but if you are given a particular number it's very hard to say whether it's uh, transcendental or algebraic uh, so that's kind of the difficulty even though there are many we by cantor's argument we know that there are many uh, transcendental numbers uh, we don't know how to, you know, it's uh, we, in general, we have no idea how to show a particular number is transcendental. The second uh, <clears throat> way to show existence of transcendental number is due to Louisville. Okay? And I think chronologically Louisville came before Cantor. So, uh, so the second way is actually the first way to show existence of uh, um, transcendental number. So what Louisville did was he wrote down a particular number and he proved that that particular number is transcendental. So what is the number that he wrote down? Let me jump ahead a little bit and tell you what the number is. So the particular number that he wrote down is this one. You take 10 to the minus n factorial and you add all these uh, as n varies from 1 to infinity. Okay. This number gets very, very small as n gets large. So the sum actually converges. OK. And uh, Louis will prove that this number is transcendental. So numbers of this form are called Louisville numbers. OK, so uh, th there's nothing very special about this number. You can write down a. Uh, you know, many uh, an infinite family of numbers like this, and they'll all be uh, transcendental. So the, you can write down a precise property uh, that you you would use to show this number is is transcendental. Uh, so such numbers are called Louisville numbers. So so Louisville was the first person to actually write down uh, one uh, particular number and prove that it's transcendental. Okay. Later on, we'll see that. Uh, I mean, numbers that Greeks knew were also uh, transcendental, but they couldn't prove it. OK, so how do how did Louisville actually prove that uh, his number uh, is transcendental? Well, he said he what he did was he said, if you have an algebraic number that is not rational. Then you can't get a very good approximation to uh, then you can't get a very good rational approximation to that number. OK. So uh, you may have seen how rational numbers are uh, constructed. These are either constructed by what are called Dedekind cuts or by taking limits. OK, so if you have any real number, you can approximate it by a rational number. Well, if you have never seen this, then here's a very easy way to see this. You take a real number, you take its decimal expansion. OK, and you truncate the decimal expansion at uh, after nth decimal place. So if you truncate it, which means that you remove everything uh, after the nth decimal place and you replace it by zeros. OK, so so here is a decimal expansion where you have replaced uh, the, the tail by zeros, which means that it's eventually repeating. And so it's a rational number. Now, when when you do it for uh, for n plus one, you get a better approximation to your rational number, uh, to your real number. OK, so if you you truncate it at 100 places, you get an approximation up to 100 decimal places by a rational number. You truncate it at th after 1000 decimal places, you get an approximation to your real number by a rational number up to 1000 decimal places and so on. Right, just like 3.14 is an approximation to pi up to two decimal places. 3.1415 is an approximation to pi up to four decimal places. 3.14159 is approximation to pi up to five decimal places. So you're approximating pi by, by these rational numbers. OK, so any uh, real number can be approximated by rational number. And you can similarly show more or less by these kind of arguments that any 
uh, complex number can be approximated by an algebraic uh, 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 by, by by an algebraic number. Okay, so so here let me actually say that this is uh, uh, in R because Louisville numbers are real numbers. So 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 it's enough to. I mean, this is what he did. So this is uh, all right. So <clears throat> so if you take any real number, then you can approximate it by a rational number. But what Louisville observed is that if your if your real number is actually algebraic, but not rational, then you can't approximate it by a rational number very well. Okay, which means what does that that a statement rigorously mean that you cannot approximate it very well. Well, if you um, if you if you take an algebraic number alpha and you uh, of degree bigger than one. Okay, so degree has to be bigger than one, which precisely means that your algebraic number is not rational. So if your algebraic number is not rational, then if you take any rational number p over q and see how far it is from alpha there is a lower bound in terms of q okay so if you want to go very close to alpha you have to make your q very large okay the closer you want to go to alpha the larger your q has to be okay so uh, so you cannot Sir. yeah uh, so to, uh, if this was well approximated then there would have been a I mean, not a lower bound, but upper bound, right? Yes, but this is yeah. So, so if if to say that something is very uh, well approximated, I would have something like this, and this might change, okay? But but it would be the inequal. It would so be what inequal. would be the prob? What would be the, would be the problem if n was less or equal to one? So if n is one, you can have uh, you know alpha could be just p by q and so so p by q minus p by q is zero so you'll never have a, such a inequality with something positive here okay and in any case we are not, i mean louisville was interested in uh, showing something is transcendental so you 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 know you better not start with something which is rational okay all right so i'll so i'll sketch a proof of this uh, very uh, quickly. Uh, the best way to do this is using mean value theorem, but let's try to avoid that, which makes it a little bit uh, uh, ugly, I suppose. The the argument, the the manipulations are are a bit tedious. But let us okay. So we are given that alpha is algebraic. Okay. Uh, you will also see where we kind of use uh, degrees bigger than one. Uh, you are given that alpha is algebraic um, of degree n. Okay, so there exists a polynomial uh, f like this with f of alpha equal to zero. And as I said, you can assume that the coefficients are actually integers, right? Because if you take rational coefficients, you can multi uh, you can clear out the denominators by multiplying f by a by by an appropriate rational number by an appropriate integer. Okay, the uh, the least common multiple of all the denominators of the coefficients, for example. OK, so I can assume that the coefficients are integers. Um, and so I have f of alpha is zero. So f of alpha is this. Now I, I take any rational number p by q and I evaluate f at that rational number. OK, so I, I just get this. Now I subtract the this quantity from this quantity. This quantity, of course, is zero. F of alpha is zero. So I get minus uh, F of P over Q is, is this thing. OK, so I'm just subtracting the second one from the first one. All right, now you see that you have terms such, such as these. Alpha to the K minus P by Q to the K for K going from one to N. In, in this sum. And so I can take my alpha minus p over q common and I have some some bunch of terms here, which I will analyze now. OK, so a typical term looks like like this with with n replaced by k, but I'll, I'll just analyze this particular term. So a typical term looks like this, right? <clears throat> 
Now, if al if p over q is far from alpha, then then we don't have much to prove, right? If p over q is bigger than one, then we don't have much to prove. So the problem is when you know the problem is about approximating alpha well, not uh, approximating it badly. So I can assume that my rational numbers are within the distance of one of alpha. Okay, so so they are they are between alpha minus one and alpha plus one. Okay, so if I try to approximate this thing in the bracket, I can put uh, mod alpha plus one instead of each of this uh, this quantity, p by q, and so basically I can approximate this by n times mod of alpha plus one to the to the n minus one. This is a very crude approximation, but this suffices for our purpose. Okay. So if I if if I if I go back here and and try to approximate mod of uh, uh, mod of f of p over q, which is this, then that has an upper bound which is given by this. Okay. Now you notice that this quantity here is independent of q uh, p by q, as long as uh, your p by q is within certain distance of uh, within certain distance of alpha. Okay. So this is independent of my, um, uh, this is independent of P by Q, and I'll just call this C alpha inverse. So this is some constant, right? C alpha inverse. <clears throat> so I get mod of uh, F of P by Q is less than or equal to mod of alpha minus P by Q times some constant, which is independent of P and Q. Now, this is a theme that, occur, uh, that, that uh, you know um, appears again and again everywhere in, in transcendental number theory, which is f is a polynomial with integer coefficients, and I know that degree of uh, I, I know that degree of f is is exactly degree of uh, alpha, and it's not one. So uh, so here's a fact which I am not uh, telling you about. Um, it is that if you take any root of this alpha, if uh, of this uh, polynomial f, it will be an uh, algebraic number of the same degree n. Okay, so in particular, no rational number is a root of this uh, polynomial because n is bigger than one. Okay, so this is what is I mean. What, what, so the 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 technical term here is that f of x is an irreducible polynomial, and so it doesn't have a rational root. Uh, so here's the here is the place where I use that n is bigger than one. Okay, so I know that it's not zero, but this means that it can't be very close to zero. Okay, so this is the crux of Louisville's uh, observation that if a, if a polynomial with integer coefficient is not zero at a rational number, then it can't be too close to zero. Well, what do I mean? If I multiply f of p over q by q to the n okay what do i get let me let me show you what i get i get that so what is f of uh, p over q this is a0 plus a1 p over q plus a2 p square over q square and so on plus a n uh, p to the n over q to the n so q to the n f of p over q is actually an integer, okay? Because I am clearing out all the denominators. Now, if you have a non-zero integer, it has to be at least uh, its mod has to be at least bigger than or equal to one, right? And so this implies that mod of f of p over q is at least one over q to the n. Right, so this theme will uh, occur again and again. That if if a uh, if a polynomial with rational uh, integer coefficient uh, is not zero at a rational number, then it can't be very close to zero. And and you, I mean, you know, the, the precise sense uh, in which it's not very close to zero will depend on a particular example. In this case, this is what it means. Sir. Okay. Yes. Please repeat the part why, why you say it is not too close to zero means how is it greater than equal to one q to the mod of q to the power n into f of p by q. 
Well, it's an integer. Do you agree with that? That it's an integer. Yeah. Oh yes. Okay. Yeah. But so if it's an it's integer, not zero. Uh, which is not zero, zero. then it's at least yeah. uh, one. The positive yes. integer. Yes. Yeah. So uh, so we get Louisville's theorem. Okay. Putting all this together. So this this thing is the main main. You know, this is the crux of Louisville's argument, and this kind of thing up occurs again and again in transcendental number theory, which is why I'm emphasizing this uh, so much. OK, uh, now coming back to Louisville's number that I that I showed you earlier. So we need to show that this can actually be very well approximated by uh, by rational numbers. OK, uh, so the rational number that we are going to take is the is the obvious one. We are going to truncate this series in mth place, okay? So you, you are taking finite sum of rational numbers. And so what you end up with is a rational number. So if we, if we truncate it at mth place, we'll call this uh, PM by QM, okay? So explicitly QM will be this, this is, this is, the, this is QM, and this, is, uh, this will be PM. Uh, now I'm not at all claiming that this is in the reduced form. Okay, I'm not at all saying that P and Q are co-prime to each other. And if you if you go back to proof of Louisville's theorem, we did not use anywhere that P and Q are co-prime to each other. So we don't have to worry about this being in the reduced form or not. Uh, doesn't matter. Okay, so if I take alpha and subtract the head of this series, you know, like the first M terms, what I am left is, is some tail some tail which is very small okay so so it's 10 to the minus m plus 1 factorial and then the you can uh, you can get an upper bound with some geometric series 10 to the uh, 10 to the minus uh, n where n goes from 1 to infinity and so you can approximate it by 9 by 10 the most important thing is it's less than uh, less than 1 okay so this is less than qm to the minus m okay so whatever constant you put, because this m is arbitrary and increasing, you're getting that uh, alpha is not a, not an algebraic number of any degree. Okay, so if, uh, so so this you know you have approximated it it uh, it very well uh, with this pm by qm. So so alpha can't be algebraic, which means that it's transcendent. Okay. So, so that. But, uh, so but, uh, Liouville's theorem says that if it is an algebraic number and it's trans and it and it's an algebraic number which is uh, irrational, then it cannot be well approximated by a rational. But does it say that if it is means the converse is the converse to? No, I am not saying the converse. I am using exactly this. If it's algebraic, it can be well approximated, which means if it cannot be well approximated. Uh, Sorry, if it's algebraic, it cannot be well approximated. So, which means that if it can be well approximated, it's not algebraic. It's not algebraic. All right. So, uh, so, th so these are two uh, different ways to sh uh, to prove existence of transcendental number, and you can see why uh, you know both will have uh, uh, both will be so appealing. They are they are fundamentally different first of all uh, first is is kind of more philosophical logic kind of argument where you show existence but it tells you nothing about specific numbers louisville's theorem on the other hand gives you specific numbers that are transcendental so both have their appeals in, in my opinion and if you want to do transcendental number theory then maybe louisville's example is uh, louisville's construction is is much uh, um, uh, much more uh, fascinating for you. Okay, so now uh, it also leads us to questions of specific uh, numbers, uh, whether they are transcendental or not. Okay, so here are some very classical questions. So the first one goes back to Greeks. Uh, they of course knew what pi was, uh, and so uh, so they they you know even they if they may not have a notion of transcendental number or algebraic number in a very precise way, they did ask this question whether pi was algebraic or not. And the form that you actually see this is, can you square a circle? Okay, so this is the form that the Greeks 
asked it in can you square a circle what this means is can you construct a square with area pi using only straight edge and compass okay you can you can measure uh, distance of one unit and you can use compass and straight edge uh, and can you construct uh, a square with side square root of pi okay and if you uh, if you see uh, infinitely many steps okay so that's kind of implicit in in the question that you you have to do it in finitely many steps and if you kind of analyze this is not easy i mean you can't analyze it sitting here if you have never seen this before if you analyze what this means is um, that pi is algebraic okay so if uh, if you can do this then pi is algebraic okay i'm not saying converse that if pi is algebraic you can necessarily do this but if you can do this then pi is algebraic okay so if you can prove that pi is not algebraic then you cannot do this Okay, so we'll see uh, soon. I'll mention the fact that pi is not algebraic, actually, and so you cannot square a circle. Uh, so this has been known for uh, about hundred and fifty years now, and so yeah, so the the phrase uh, squaring a circle is is used for something which is impossible to do. Okay, all right. So um, so it has crept into common usage now. Squaring a circle. So you you call something you know you can't square a circle means you can't you can't do the, the this task is squaring a circle means that this task is impossible. The second example is Euler's number. Okay, so this is this sum uh, one by n factorial. You you take sum over all n bigger than or equal to zero. So this has this uh, this approximation right uh, decimal expand the first few. Uh, digits of decimal expansion, and again you can ask: Is is Euler's number rational? Is it transcendental, and so on? You can also ask the same thing about logarithms, and logarithm will play important role later on in this in this talk. Okay, so here are the things that people proved long time ago. So Lambert proved in oops, what happened here? Um, in 1761 that pi is actually irrational okay so what he did was he took a um, um, uh, uh, the conti um, what is continued fraction expansion of pi given by uh, by the tan function trigonometric function tan and so using that he proved that uh, uh, pi is actually irrational okay uh, but it took more than hundred years to show that pi is actually transcendental. Okay, so this was first proven by uh, Lindemann uh, in 1882, and later on I'll mention what is called Lindemann Weierstrass theorem, which is a generalization of what Lindemann proved. So Lindemann gave a sketch of this, and Weierstrass was the one who actually uh, filled in all the details. Uh, Lindemann was inspired by an approach given by uh, Hermit in 1873, where he proved that E is transcendental. Okay, so he proved that E is transcendental. So we are going to see Hermit's uh, proof about uh, of transcendence of E. Okay, so this part is a bit technical, and uh, I hope I don't lose all of you here. Uh, um, but you know, don't worry about it if you can't understand it real time. Uh, it's it's kind of not easy, and and in some sense later on in the talk, I, I'm going to tell you that uh, even though we can prove much more by now, kind of the techniques are uh, uh, that that we have in transcendental number theory actually go back to uh, Hermit and Lindemann and Weierstrass and so on. Okay, so um, uh, so so somehow the techniques are quite elementary, only they get trickier and trickier. So. Uh, so this is why this, this subject is so fascinating that uh, so something that was done up uh, almost 150 years ago is, is still so relevant. Um, and it's also very hard because you know you can't uh, people haven't been able to come up with many new techniques. Um, OK, so uh, so before we, we dive into the proof of uh, Hermit's theorem to show that E is transcendental, uh, let me uh, le le let's prove a, a preliminary result, uh, a lemma. Um, so, 
<clears throat> so what I do, so here I, I use a little bit of uh, calculus, um, integration and some differentiation. So f of x is any polynomial with, uh, with real coefficients, okay? Uh, later on, I'm going to take a very specific polynomial. And so I could have, at the beginning, I could have started with that very specific polynomial, but it's not necessary. So f of x is a real polynomial. I define the function f of t by this definite integral. So I, I go from zero to t, e to the power t minus u, f of u du. Okay, so so I just take this uh, this function and integrate it. Um, all right. Uh, then the lemma claims that actually you can write i of t as this sum. Okay, so here uh, f to the bracket j means jth derivative. Okay, so these are, uh, this is uh, jth derivative of f. Okay, so you keep differentiating f j times. Um, now, even though this sum looks infinite, it's actually finite because f is a polynomial. So if you, if you take a polynomial of degree um, n, then n plus one th derivative of, of that polynomial is zero. Okay, so even though the sum looks infinite, it's actually not infinite. It's just I don't want to uh, carry around an, uh, a notation for degree of f. It's a finite sum. And so all I need to use here is integration by parts, which is okay, this expression. If you, uh, if you have only seen it for indefinite integrals, then for definite integrals, it's okay, more, I mean, you know, the same thing. Uh, you just have to evaluate v times u at at the uh, at a and b okay so all i need to do is 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 kind of do integration by parts and after doing it once i get this minus f of t so so if i use this expression uh, here what i get is uh, is this so minus f of t plus e to the t f of 0 and then my <coughs> My integral gets replaced by a similar integral, but f is replaced by derivative of f. Okay, the first derivative. And so if I do it again, I'll get minus f prime of t plus e to the t f prime of zero. Uh, so f1 of zero plus the same kind of integral with uh, f1 replaced by f2 and so on and so forth. Okay, so uh, so if you repeat it enough number of times, you you get this because eventually the derivatives are all zero. Okay, so that's that's the lemma. Now we can go back to our our uh, theorem. So what is the theorem that E is transcendental? So we do this by contradiction. <coughs> we assume that E is algebraic, and we put n for degree of E. Okay, so, so E satisfies a polynomial of, of a certain uh, degree. Uh, so I call that polynomial A0 plus A1x plus A2x squared and so on up to Anx to the n. And when I put x equal to E, I get zero. All these Ais are integers. Now what I do is I define J to be uh, A0 plus I0, A1 plus I1 and so on up to An plus In. <clears throat> okay, but now I if, if I use the lemma, so this is using the lemma, I, lemma above. So what what is happening is that in the in this lemma, uh, this quantity, the, the the thing here, doesn't depend on on t, right? This quantity, this thing, the sum doesn't depend on t. So this comes out and you get summation ai uh, e to the i, right, which is zero by, uh, uh, by definition of that polynomial. And so that term disappears and what you are left is, is this. Okay, what you are left with uh, is with this. All right, and uh, so that's my, my, uh, my j. But now I can, my, I am free to choose my polynomial f. Okay, so you have to make a clever choice of, of the polynomial f. Uh, now, I mean, the, the way this proof is presented, it might look very unmotivated, but I don't have time to go into kind of uh, giving you the proof, which is uh, which might motivate it. 
in any case uh, the you know the the way i present it it looks like a, a very clever choices of this and that and and it is actually very clever choices of this and that make no mistake about it um so you can motivate certain steps in the in the proof which i don't have time to do uh, but nevertheless it is uh, the the the, the fundamental fact is that it's it's sort of clever choices of of all these polynomials and all these integrals and so on okay so so what choice of f do i take so i take a prime number p and the fact that p is a prime number will play a part later uh, which is which is larger than n and you know p will later on will take p to be very large prime number okay so in particular larger than n and also um, uh, larger than other i mean you know things that will come on later and i take f to be this particular polynomial what is the degree of f uh, so i can i mean it's not relevant but degree of f is um np plus p minus 1 okay so that's the uh, that's the degree of f it, this is not really relevant but i'm just writing down the degree okay now the amazing thing about this polynomial is that you can find uh, you can evaluate derivatives at this of this polynomial at various integers okay and and you can take this i mean differentiating polynomials is very easy you just have to know how to differentiate monomial and you have to know that taking derivative is a linear operation uh, so you can i mean here you have to use product formula and so on so you can take derivatives of this and you you will uh, you can prove that if j is less than p and k, k is bigger than 0 then you get 0 this value is 0 if j is if but if k is 0 and j is less than p minus 1 then uh, then again you get 0 if j is bigger than p you get something which is uh, uh, which is divisible by <clears throat> p minus 1 factorial okay i mean eventually of course uh, the derivative is 0 when j is bigger than the degree uh, you get zero but zero is also divisible by p minus 1 factorial so if j is bigger than p irrespective of what k is you get z, you get z, you get something which is zero mod p factorial but the most interesting term is when k is zero and j is p minus 1 right this is the term that's not been covered in these three cases when j is p minus 1 and k is zero you get this precise thing okay n to the power p times p minus 1 factorial and some sign okay minus plus or minus n to the p times p minus 1 factorial so in particular you can see that if n uh, if n is less than p if p is large then this term is not divisible by p okay this term is not divisible by p everything else is divisible by p only this particular term is not divisible by p okay and if you take p to be larger than all these coefficients then none of these coefficients will be divisible by the prime number p okay so what you can show is that by the way so all these numbers are divisible by p minus 1 factorial okay so you can show so so what you get is that all these things all these things here this is a even though it looks like an infinite sum it's not so all all these uh, all terms in here are divisible by p minus 1 factorial and there is a particular term which is not divisible by p okay all other terms are actually divisible by p p factorial it means that j is divisible by p minus 1 factorial but j is not divisible by p okay? because if if you take Hundred terms, which each of which is divisible by p, and you add to it something which is not divisible by p, then the resulting sum will not be divisible by p. Okay, so j is not divisible by p, which it means two things. Okay, first thing is that j is not zero. If if j were zero, j would be divisible by p. <clears throat> i mean this this 
the scary looking number, how do we show that it's not zero? We show that it's not zero by showing that it's not divisible by P. That's the sole purpose of choosing this prime that we can show it's not divisible by P and hence we know that something is non-zero. That's the only purpose of P. But second thing, J is actually an integer, right? Because, because F is a polynomial with integer coefficients. We are, if, and so all its derivatives are polynomials with integer coefficients. We are evaluating it at an integer. So the resulting value is also an integer. We are multiplying an integer by another integer and taking sums. So J is actually an integer. So of course, I mean, I should have said this earlier because I'm talking about divisibility. So it's an integer which is not divisible by P, hence non-zero, but divisible by P minus one factorial. So again, this is the kind of step that I was emphasizing in Louisville's theorem. We are using that if, if you know so, something about an, I mean, we, we are using that integers are somehow uh, spaced at, at, at particular distance, right? So, so if, <clears throat> if an integer is not zero, but divisible by P minus one factorial, then that integer has to be at least as big as p minus 1 factorial. Okay, so that's why we get mod of j <coughs> is at least p minus 1 factorial. So this is one inequality that we get. This is one important inequality that we get. Now we get an inequality in the other direction, which will say that actually j is small. And that's how we'll get a contradiction. So, uh, so I will kind of uh, go very quickly over this step because this step is, is easier uh, than the first one. It's, it's easier than this inequality. Uh, it's, you just have to, uh, to write everything down. So, uh, so if you look at what the, what the definition of each of the, uh, no, these should be AIs, sorry, these should be, not QIs, AIs. Okay, these are these coefficients that I had here. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So if you look at what the definition of J is, and if you look at what the definition of I is, then you will easily be able to show that actually um, mod of J is less than or equal to this sum. Okay. So, so I'm taking some integral. Right o over some uh, some interval, and so if I uh, if I replace the integral uh, the function in the integral by some by by the maximum value that that function takes in in that particular interval, then I I, I get um, uh, you know I mean okay let let me so if I if I'm sort of getting trying to find uh, area under this curve I can replace it by by this rectangle. And so that's what I'm doing. Okay, this kind of thing. I'm 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 replacing area under a curve by by area of the rectangle. So that's more or less the I mean that's the crux of the argument here. So you get this. <clears throat> okay. Um. Yeah. So. So, but what are what what is this? This is this is a polynomial of certain degree. Okay, so degree n p uh, plus uh, p minus one. So what I can do is I can actually show that this thing is less than or equal to c to the power p for some constant c which is independent of p. Okay, I mean if you look at this, then more or less you know it's it's clear from from here that uh, that you are. Uh, you are something to the power p, well, except for this term, but I can, but this is p minus one. So I can replace this p minus one by a bigger power, as long as I am putting x to be bigger than, uh, bigger than or equal to one. So, so this is something which is independent of p to the power p, right? That's, that's the kind of thing. So, so I can, repl I can, I can show that this is less than or equal to c to the power p for some constant c which is uh, completely independent of p, okay? So I get my uh, second, uh, uh, I get my second uh, inequality here. Now putting these two things together, 
what do I get? I get that uh, P minus one factorial is less than or equal to mod J is less than or equal to C to the P. Okay. <clears throat> but, uh, and this is for all P, all P's, okay, all primes P. But I can, if I take P to be sufficiently large, then C to the P is actually less than P minus one factorial. Because how does P minus one factorial grow? It grows like uh, P minus one to the right. power P minus factorial one. Factorial growth is greater. Than yeah, right. Exponential growth. Right. So, so, C so, so uh, we haven't chosen P at the start of the problem, but now we choose sufficient uh, a P so such that this holds. Yes. yes. Yeah. I mean, at the beginning, we chose P to be larger than N and yeah. larger than all the coefficients. That's all. Hmm. For, for the arguments to work out. But for now we are just specifying P. For this argument, we had to take P to be larger than N and larger than all the coefficients. Yes. Okay. Now we, are, we, we take it sufficiently large. So in particular, those conditions will of course be met, but we might have to increase P further. So again, this is the kind of argument which, which you know, this is the kind of thing that appears again and again in transcendental number theory that if an integer is not zero, then there is a very nice lower bound on it. It can't be very close to, well, it can't be closer to zero than one. But, and also in some sense, this is a p-adic argument. You know, you, you are doing something which, you are using divisibility now. In, in Louisville's uh, theorem, we just use that an integer was non-zero, so it was at least one. A positive integer was non-zero. I mean, okay, so a non-negative integer was non-zero, so it was at least one. Here we are saying that a non-negative integer, I mean, a positive integer is divisible by p minus one factorial, so it's at least p minus one factorial. Uh, so these kind of lower bounds are usually the harder ones, and then the upper bounds are usually easier ones, and then that's how you get contradiction. Okay, so he, so those were the two proofs that I wanted to uh, to tell you about Louisville's theorem and uh, and Amit's theorem on transcendence of E. Okay, so now we move on and at a at a faster pace, and I'll tell you about some conjectures. Okay, so this uh, this uh, uh, this area is full of conjectures, and and you know no one has any idea about uh, how to how to prove most of them. Okay, so now we, we saw a notion of transcendental number. We can refine it and say that alpha 1, alpha 2 up to alpha n are algebraically independent if there does not exist a polynomial in n variables, non-zero polynomial with coefficients in Q, such that f of alpha 1 and so on is, is 0. Okay, so this so n equal to one means that alpha is uh, transcendental. Okay, alpha one is transcendental. But you can have true transcendental numbers which could be algebraically dependent. For instance, E is transcendental, so E square is transcendental. But they are not algebraically independent. Right? I, I can take <clears throat> x squared minus y as my polynomial and, and so if I put x equal to e and y equal to e squared I get uh, I, I, I get zero okay so so you can have two transcendental numbers which are algebraically dependent right but uh, what I what I want to what, what the notion I need is algebraically independent so there's no polynomial with n variables okay now I can define what I mean by transcendence degree of, of a certain uh, finite set of uh, um, complex numbers. So transcendence degree is M. If I can find exact, at, at, I mean, if I can find exactly uh, M independent, algebraically independent elements, okay? Uh, yeah, this, this is a bit uh, sort of ambiguous. What I mean is, Transcendence degree is the largest integer m such that I can find m algebraically independent elements in this set. Okay, so that's what I mean. Uh, I'm not going to rewrite it. So tr transcendence degree is m. It's, it's the largest integer m such that I can find m algebraically independent uh, elements in this. Okay, so that was the notion of transcendence uh, uh, degree. So for example, we don't know whether uh, pi and e are algebraically independent okay uh, one suspects they are 
but we have no idea whether pi and e are algebraically independent. Okay. <clears throat> so just as I said, uh, whether uh, a given number is transcendental or not is, is a hard problem. Similarly, whether given set of uh, transcendental numbers are algebraically independent or not is a very hard problem. You can show that there are actually infinitely many algebraically independent elements. So, I mean, you know, given a fine integer n, you can find n uh, complex numbers which are algebraically independent. So you can show their existence. Uh, but a specific set, we, we have no idea how to say something. So here's the biggest conjecture in the in the area. So uh, if you want immortality, this is oops, this is what you should prove. Chaniel's conjecture. OK, so this was made about in 1960s, I think. And as often happened uh, with these conjectures in that era, I don't think Chaniel ever wrote anything down. So I think this is this was written down by Lang and he attributed it to Chaniel. Uh, so what does Chaniel's conjecture from 1960s says? He says that if you take alpha 1 up to alpha n, which are complex numbers, and linearly independent over q. So I don't know if you have heard this term linearly independent. It means that there is no linear polynomial in n variables. Okay, so linear, non-zero linear polynomials in n variables. Okay, so i.e. There does not exist a one x one plus a n x n uh, a one up to a n in Q uh, not all zero such that summation a i uh, alpha i is equal to zero. Okay, so it does not satisfy a non-zero linear polynomial. That's what linearly independent means. So if you take <clears throat> n complex numbers, I'm not saying anything about whether they are algebraic or not, which are linearly independent over Q, and you take these two n uh, numbers, alpha 1 up to alpha n, and then e to the power alpha 1 up to alpha n, then their transcendence degree is at least n. Okay? So this is the this is Chaniel's conjecture. All right. Now there are two extremal cases of this, and you will see how you know, like the the breadth of this thing. One extremal case is when all these alpha i's are algebraic. Okay, so one extremal case is when all these alpha i's are actually algebraic numbers. So algebraic numbers could still be uh, linearly independent over Q, right? For example. I could take uh, n equal to two, and I could take um, I could take uh, alpha one equal to to one, and alpha two equal to square root of two. Okay, so so those two will be linearly independent over Q. There is no polynomial. Uh, there is no linear polynomial in Q in two variables such that alpha one, alpha two are are root of. Uh, that's that's precisely saying that square root of two is not a rational number. Then transcendence degree of e to the power alpha one up to e to the power alpha n is equal to n, right? This is exactly what Chaniel's conjecture would predict because uh, we know that these are all algebraic. So the only the the transcendence degree can at most be n, and Lindemann Weierstrass proved in 1983. OK, so uh, more than 100 years ago, the transcendence degree is actually n. So this case is known. This extremal case of Chaniel's conjecture is known. And you can show using this extremal case that E is transcendental, right? Because you can just take um, alpha 1 to be 1, and that will be linearly independent over Q. So, so this is another proof that E is transcendental. You can show that pi is transcendental using this. How do you show that pi is uh, is transcendental? Because uh, you know that e to the power uh, pi times i is minus one. Okay. So if pi were not transcendental, if pi were algebraic, then you would have that i pi and these these both will be algebraic. 
and so uh, uh, so that will that will uh, violate Lindemann Weiss trust theorem, right? If this is if pi is algebraic, then i times pi is algebraic, and if i times pi is algebraic, uh, then e to the power i times pi will be transcendental by Lindemann Weiss trust theorem. But e to the power i times pi is minus one. So that's how you. That's how Lindemann proved that pi is transcendental. Um, okay. The other extremal case in, is when all the e to the power alpha i's are algebraic. Okay. Then, such that these are linearly independent as as before over Q. Then Schanuel's conjecture says that transcendence degree of alpha one up to alpha n is exactly n. Okay. It can be at most n because these are algebraic. And Schanuel's conjecture predicts that it, it is exactly n. Another way of saying this is that if you take algebraic numbers and if you take logs of those, so if you don't like taking logs of uh, complex numbers, you can just think about a uh, log of real number. Uh, taking log of complex number is a bit tricky because uh, you have to choose a branch. Uh, and so if you know about that, then the comment I want to make is that whatever branch you choose, it doesn't matter. Uh, this is uh, even if you choose different branches for each of these uh, uh, things, uh, you the 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 conclusion should still be true. Okay, that's what the that's what the conjecture says. So if beta one up to uh, beta n are algebraic numbers such that these logs are linearly independent over Q. Okay, so a very weak condition that it does not satisfy a linear polynomial over Q. Then the conjecture says that it does not satisfy a polynomial of any degree over Q. Okay, so if it does not satisfy linear polynomial, then it does not satisfy polynomial of any any degree. Okay, uh, so this is completely open. Okay, so this is sometimes called weak Schanuel's conjecture because it's a bit different than it's a bit weaker than Schanuel's conjecture. But uh, you, you know, even if you prove this, you you are sure to become immortal. <laughs> so. Uh, so that's uh, that's uh, weak Schanuel's conjecture. Now let me come back to let me uh, go back uh, about hundred years to Hilbert's seventh problem. So what Hilbert asked was, um, if you have alpha and beta, which are algebraic numbers, and you avoid sort of uh, simple cases like alpha is zero or one, and alpha is a, and beta is a rational number, then what can you say about alpha to the power beta? Okay, and the case that he kind of had in mind is what is two to the power square root of two? Is it transcendental or not? Okay, and uh, Hilbert made a list of twenty-three problems in nineteen hundred, which he said would uh, would uh, would influence. I mean, uh, these are the important problem for us to solve for in next hundred years, and this was seventh of those problems. So that's why this is called Hilbert's seventh problem. And he he said that this problem is very hard in his opinion, and Riemann hypothesis and Fermat's last theorem would be uh, solved before this problem. Uh, and you see how wrong he was because Gelfand and Schneider solved this problem in 1934. Okay, so about 30 uh, 34 years after he uh, stated the problem. Okay, so he so the so if you avoid some simple cases, then alpha to the beta. Should always be transcendental. That's what uh, Gelfand and Schneider proved. And how did they prove this? So they they proved it like this. Okay. So what they did was they took alpha one and alpha two to be algebraic numbers such that log of alpha one and log of alpha two are linearly independent over Q. Okay. So they do not satisfy any linear polynomial with coefficients in Q. If that is true. Then they prove that they do not satisfy any linear polynomial with coefficients in Q bar. So this is much, much weaker than Schanuel's conjecture. But that was enough to get Hilbert's uh, seventh problem. OK, so I, I give this as an exercise for you to 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 deduce that alpha to the beta is transcendental uh, using uh, this statement uh, that Gelfand and Schneider proved that if log alpha one and log alpha two are linearly independent over Q, then they are linearly independent over Q bar. So using that, you can prove things like 
log 2 by log 3 are trans is transcendental and so on. <clears throat> okay, so, uh, so sorry, I'm going a bit over time, but uh, if you give me five more minutes, I should finish. Uh, <clears throat> so, Gelfand and Schneider, they proved this independently around the same time in, in 1934. Okay, um, right, and uh, they proved it for logs of two algebraic numbers. Okay, and they said, well, why restrict at two? If you take logs of n algebraic numbers, uh, log of alpha one, log of alpha two, up to log of alpha n, which are linearly independent over Q, then they conjectured that they should be linearly independent over Q bar. Okay. This is exactly what Alan Baker proved in 1966, and he got a Fields Medal for doing this. So he proved that if alpha 1, alpha 2 up to alpha n are algebraic numbers, whose log is linearly independent over Q, then those logs are also linearly independent over Q bar. Okay? So you see this is much, much weaker than this weak Schanuel's conjecture. Weak Schanuel's conjecture says that it cannot satisfy a polynomial of any degree over Q or over Q bar. It doesn't matter which you take when you when you do not restrict the degree. It doesn't matter which you take. But when you restrict the degree, it matters whether you are over Q or Q bar. And so this is much weaker than Chanel's conjecture, but it's incredibly hard to prove this. Um, but again, I should say that the techniques are quite elementary, but extremely clever. OK, and in some sense, there hasn't been much progress beyond uh, what Baker proved. Uh, so there has been some progress, and I'll, I'll come to that. But beyond uh, linear polynomials, there hasn't been much progress at all. This is where we are stuck at for the last 50 years uh, uh, in transcendence theory. So beyond linear polynomials, you can ask for what have degree two polynomials. And also, and even that is conjectural. So even a specific degree two polynomial is conjectural. So what is so what is four exponential conjecture? This is like the 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 most tantalizing thing. It's ex, this is an extremely hard conjecture in my opinion. But maybe beyond Baker, this is what we would like to do. This would constitute as a major progress beyond uh, beyond uh, what Baker did. So if you take lambda 1, lambda 2, and beta 1, beta 2, four complex numbers, such that lambda 1 and, la uh, sorry, not, uh, uh, this should be lambda 1 and lambda 2, lambda 1 and lambda 2. These are algebraically, uh, these are linearly independent over Q, and beta 1, beta 2 are also linearly independent over Q. Then at least one of these numbers are, is transcendental. This is a way of, uh, of stating this. This was this has been attributed to Siegel in 1940s. OK, <clears throat> another way of stating the same thing, and you can think about why these two ways are equivalent uh, as an exercise. So uh, this will if you want to understand what the problem is, then if you take alpha 1, 1, alpha 1, 2, alpha 2, 1, and alpha 2, 2, I, I have numbered them in this specific way for a reason because I want to write it as a matrix. These are algebraic numbers such that when I when I take logs of this and form this 2 by 2 matrix, then the, then the rows and the columns of this matrix are linearly independent over Q. Then I want to show that... Uh, determinant of m is not zero. That's the conjecture. That's the four exponential conjecture. OK, if if rows and columns are linearly independent over Q, that need not mean that the determinant is not zero. I'll give you an example. Uh, so one square root of two square root of two and two. So here rows and columns are linearly independent over uh, Q, but uh, the uh, the determinant is in fact zero. Okay, so so this is not at all uh, true that if the rows and columns are linearly independent over Q, then the determinant is non-zero. So what does this mean? If I take product of this and this and subtract the product of this and this, I get a non-zero number. So that's what uh, four exponential conjecture says. Uh, An exact. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so. Um, 
A consequence of this is if t is a real number which is not rational, can you find a, a real number which is not rational such that uh, t to the, uh, 2 to the t and 3 to the t are both integers? Okay. Four exponential conjecture will say that you cannot find such a t. Okay. This is just an uh, uh, an example to show uh, to say that you can find you can find a uh, one you can find a t such that one of them is an integer okay so this is a t such that 2 to the log 3 to the base 2 is 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 3 okay so you can find one of them but not uh, 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 but not for both okay now i i promised you that i'll tell you what uh, the progress beyond this so if you if you re so this is called six exponential conjecture and i'll stop with a six exponential theorem expo Shields theorem. This was proven by Lang and Ramachandra um, uh, in around 1956. Okay, um, independently, what this says is that if you take log of alpha one one, log of alpha one two, log of alpha one three log of uh, alpha 2 1 log of alpha uh, 2 2 and log of alpha 2 3 uh, such that so alpha i j's are are algebraic numbers such that uh, rows and columns are linearly independent over Q, then, um, uh, then I'll just say rank of M is, is two, which means that you can find a two by two sub matrix. So, so you know, either, uh, either these two things or these two things or these two or these two things. If you take a two by two matrix uh, made up of, of this, then at least one of them has a non-zero determinant. OK, uh, that's what rank two means. Uh, so this is the six exponential theorem. And you see this was uh, this was uh, shown in 1956. There is a generalization of this due to Waldschmidt, uh, which is again an old theorem from 1970s. And, and that is the cutting edge. We, we, we don't know anything beyond that. So so if you if you fancy, you can you can try to try to prove you can take alpha one, alpha two, alpha uh alpha one one alpha one two alpha two one alpha two two to be uh to be rational numbers if you like and try to prove this okay uh so uh, so if you if you can make any progress whatsoever on four, four exponential conjecture you think that's a sure short way of becoming famous all right so i'll stop with that Thank you very much, sir. Yeah, so are there any questions? Or yes, if anybody has any question, they can ask. <clears throat> OK, I hope that wasn't so, uh, in the last the last, uh, last theorem you mentioned by Lang. Um, yeah. What do you exactly mean when the rows are linearly independent over Q? Yeah, so this is me uh, uh, not define this uh, linear independence. It means that um, uh, right. So yeah, I want this. So it means that uh, <clears throat> uh, there does not exist um, um, a1 x1 plus a2 x2 uh, with coefficients in Q. Uh, da, da, da. With a1 and a2 in Q such that uh, a1 log alpha 1 1 plus a2 log 
uh, alpha 2 1 is equal to 0 and a1 log alpha 1 2 plus a2 log alpha uh, uh, 2 2 is equal to 0 and a1 log alpha 1 3 plus a2 log alpha 2 3 is equal to 0. So simultaneously uh, each of the column should be a column wise. Yeah, yeah so this is what does it, not exist. This is what, yeah, there does not exist. So this is what it means for rows to be linearly independent. Okay. Uh, even though I'm taking in this is what for I, columns for columns just uh, a1 a2 a3 yeah a yeah, and this is exactly what it also means in the in the four exponentials uh, um, conjecture in in the second uh, formulation of it. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so the uh, yeah. By the way, I, I should uh, maybe there are no questions. Let me uh, give you one interesting thing. Uh, so using Baker's theorem, you can show that um, uh, e to the power pi is, is transcendental. So you can show that uh, e to the power pi is uh, transcendental and how do you show that e to the power pi is minus one to the power minus i okay so i mean not baker's theorem you you can do it using gelfand schneider so um, it's transcendental by gelfand uh, schneider theorem Okay, so so an interesting thing that you. I mean, th this expression is also perhaps uh, nice to look at. If you take minus one to the power minus i, you get e to the power pi. So oh, there's somebody who said, "Can you go over the proof of e is transcendental?" It's a yeah. I mean, I can go over it, but maybe it's not the best use of everyone's time. Uh, I'll send these notes. Uh, and so, by the way, I should I should say that uh, a, a very good reference is Alan Baker's book. So, so reference for all this. called transcendental number theory, I think, or introduction to transcendental number theory. One of the two, transcendental number theory. Very it's start a, from the basics of transcendental number theory. Uh, yes. OK, so the point, I mean, the, the, the arguments in transcendental number theory are usually kind of uh, elementary. They use some amount of analysis. Uh, integration differentiation and then some amount of analysis. Uh, but uh, I mean, you know, if you, uh, uh, there's no reason why you can't, uh, uh, if, if you, you know, the, the, if you're motivated enough, then I think there's, there's no reason why you can't read this book. It's not uh, as advanced as uh, some other number theory things that one learns. Transcendental number, the, the methods in transcendental number theory are usually very elementary. Uh, you do need some amount of calculus, but uh, th that you can pick up uh, uh, while reading this book, I think. Um, so this is a very good book. It's not very, it's not very big. Uh, a big in this book, he also proves uh, his own, th I mean, he gives a proof of his exposition of proof of his theorem. Uh, and that's that's kind of technical to read, but uh, but again the arguments are elementary. I mean, it, it uses some complex analysis, but if you uh, if you take it as a black box, you can you can certainly read the book. 
so I, yeah i can go over the proof but i, I just Sir, think can you briefly go over the counting principle of uh, q bar that uh, enables us to prove that q bar is countable yeah so if you if you know that uh, so so are you willing to grant that q is countable yes sir yes sir yeah so uh, uh, okay so then <clears throat> Uh, if you uh, right, so if you take, uh, uh, shall we sum it over all the coefficients? No, no. So no, you don't do that. If you are willing to grant this, then the next thing I'm going to ask you is uh, um, if you take sequences, sequences. Q bar should be a subset of Q, right? No, Q bar is not a Q bar. Q is a subset of Q bar, not that. Oh, sorry, yes. If you take sequences uh, of rational numbers, A1, A2, and so on, such that, uh, which are eventually zero, which are eventually zero then uh, this set uh, this the set of such sequences is countable so you have to prove this okay i mean uh, yeah right uh, the the way to prove this is so okay uh, are you willing to grant me that q cross q is is countable yes sir yes sir. and then are you willing to grant me that this q n times this is countable n times right? okay this, yes yeah, so then the sequences are like union over n bigger than or equal to one of q to the n. This is q to the n. Okay. This is what these uh, these sequences are. Okay. So countable union of countable sets is countable. Uh, okay. I, I, <laughs> That, that's that's the next thing I'm going to ask you. Are you willing to grant this? Uh, uh, yes, sir. Uh, yeah. Then uh, then this implies that the uh, the set of all polynomials with coefficients in uh, Q is countable because you can just you take any polynomial you, uh, of degree n, then you can map uh, the coefficient in this q to the n, right? Q to the n plus one. Yes, sir. Yeah. So, and then each polynomial has only finitely many roots. Okay. So if you have a if you have a map from a, a finite to one. Uh, uh, yeah, so so then then you have a countable so, so then you have a countable union of finite sets, right? So you, what you have is somehow I mean this is not a disjoint union. This is the set Q bar only. So yeah, this is that's the set. Should be done. Yeah, so so Q bar is a finite union. So um, so I will call it V of f. F is a polynomial. Uh, with coefficients in Q uh, not zero, F is non-zero polynomial, and V of F is roots of F. Okay, these are all finite sets, so you have a countable union of finite sets. So, uh, so that's again countable. Yes, sir. Thanks. Uh, but uh, can we go the other way around that uh, we can just take uh, a polynomial of degree n and we are just fixing just n minus one of the coefficients and 
just uh, we have one coefficient uh, that we are not fixing and we are just ma mapping that one to one so we are getting uh, creating this bijection with the natural numbers so uh, then uh, uh, once what we is, are done with this then we are no no what is it by what what is the what is your domain uh, just like uh, we are, uh, we do with one uh, Q set that uh, to prove that Q is countable. In the same manner, uh, we are just fixing all of the uh, coefficients and uh, not fixing the other one uh, or the last one. Then. Yeah, I, I, I still don't understand what your set is. The first set that you are taking the bijection from. That means uh, I want to say that uh, say, uh, suppose uh, a one a one x to the power one plus a two x to the power two up to a n x to the power n. We have fixed a one up to a to the power okay. a n minus one. First of all, it's only polynomial in one variable. Uh, yes, uh, yes, sir. For uh, only a polynomial in one variable, I can prove that. Well, I don't. Yeah, I don't know what statement you are saying. You can prove so. You're not. You're not making. You're not uh, making a statement first, which you're claiming to prove. You have to. You have to tell me what statement. What is the statement that you are proving? Okay, sir. I have to rethink and a bit, and I uh, will then tell you. Okay. So, yeah. if there are uh, any other questions, are there any other questions? Otherwise, uh, we can end the session here. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. All right. Bye. Thank you, sir.